What's up, church? I'm so glad you're here. Uh, thank you for choosing to worship with us today. We are closing up this series today called Monsters with a lesson that is near to dear, near and dear in my heart because I went trick-or-treating as this person. We are talking about how to deal with a big bad wolf, okay? How to deal with a big bad wolf. A little bit of history of, of the big bad wolf. There are countless movies and TV shows and cartoons that um, are told from stories that go all the way back to the Grimm brothers. Most people believe that the story of the Big Bad Wolf got its origin from a Norse story of Loki, who dressed up as a grandmother and went to a wedding. However, at the wedding, people kept noticing the way he ate and the way he acted, and they began to ask him, are you really the grandmother? So some people believe that's where the story came from. Some people believe it came from a story of how a wolf every night would swallow the sun, but every morning a lumberjack would cut the wolf open and the sun would reemerge. Others trace it back to different ancient stories that I think are probably more accurate that were designed to keep kids from entering forests when predators were a very real concern and both the parents were working extremely hard to try to provide just simple food for themselves. So they told stories that would keep their children from wandering off into the forest during the day. Either way, most of the time, the big bad wolf is either blowing down the house of the three little pigs or he is disguising himself as the sweet grandmother to eat Little Red Riding Hood. And he reminds me of Goliath. The big bad wolf reminds me of Goliath. So if you'll read first with me, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 41, see if you can pick up how Goliath might be the big bad wolf. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, this is a big indicator that he's the big bad wolf, am I a dog that you have come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. We are picking up at this point that Goliath is probably not going to win any friends or influence people. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and I will cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. That is so interesting to me, that David ran towards him. David put his hand in his bag and took out his stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. I mean, this is a this is a intense story. You'd have a hard time finding any story like this. Uh, even if you watch, you know, any of the new shows like this story is an intense story. And I think that Goliath reminds me of the big bad wolf because he loves to devour people. And this is what big bad wolves do. They love to devour people and they usually try at their first meeting to be very very sweet. Think about what uh, the big bad wolf does when Little Red Riding Hood bumps into him. He's very sweet, dressed as the nice, kind grandmother. And he says, uh, she says to him, what nice teeth you have. Think about when he meets the little pig. What does he say to them? Dear little pig, please let me in. They will put on kindness, but the big bad wolf comes out whenever you disagree with them. And here's what happens when you disagree with the big bad wolf. They will huff and they will puff and they will try to blow you down. So much so that it's hard to keep track of just who the big bad wolf is fighting this week. Right? Like we all know that person at work on Tuesday, they're going to fight with Tom 
on Wednesday with Wednesday with with Wendy on Thursday with Timothy and on Friday with Frank. Like they're going to just fight with someone every day of the week and it's hard for me to keep track of like who are we mad at today, right? They have so many arguments and fights with so many people that they simply rotate from one to the next. What do we see the big bad wolf doing? Let me blow your house down. Okay, let me blow your house down. Okay, let me blow your house down. And what do we see Goliath doing? Send anyone to fight me. I will fight anyone. Big bad wolves love to fight so much so that they do not have discussions, they have fights. You all know someone you can't talk about Ohio State football with because it just turns instantly into a fight? Like we can't, we can't discuss politics because it's not a discussion, it's a fight. They, they, Goliath says to David, I will feed you to the birds. He's not interested in discussing geopolitical science in that, in that time. Big bad wolves typically don't give ideas, they give commands. They don't give ideas, they give commands. We all know someone at work, their suggestion is not a suggestion. It is something that you had better get done or you are going to be on their bad, <laughs> naughty list. I knew someone like this one time. They said to me, I need to have a meeting with you. I've got this idea to help the church. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's Sunday afternoon. Okay, when do you want to meet? They said, tomorrow. I said, I can't. I've got two meetings. They said, no, you need to cancel those. I said, I, I I can't cancel those. I can't, like, just, you know, I got to have those. No, you better cancel those. I'm going to help. I'm like, well, I can't cancel those. So that turned into, like, you're too busy. How You should know. You should be able to tell people no. Why don't you tell people no more often? And finally, I said to the person, I said, I am telling someone no right now. It's you. <laughs> so this meeting rolls around. Three weeks go by. This meeting rolls around, and they're like, I got this idea. It's going to help you. I'm, okay, all right, let's, let me hear it. The idea is let's not tell anybody this is coming, but you and I are going to have Sharpies and pieces of paper. And when people come in, we're going to tell them, take your shoes off right now. I'm like, well, I don't like this all right idea already. <laughs> they said, we're going to put all the shoes. There's going to be no church. We're going to put all the shoes in a big pile in the middle of the room, and you don't go get to pick up your shoes unless you memorize five people's names. I was like, we're probably not going to do that this week. I, I, and it turned into, why don't you want to do this? You need to do this. This is something you need to do. I, we're not going to do that. And which turned into, you know what's wrong with this church? No one knows anyone's names, which turned into, you're a bad pastor, which turned into this angry email I got from them. Why? They're a big bad wolf. They don't give ideas. They give commands. And in our jobs and in our church world, and in our families, we all know someone who it's not a suggestion, it's not an idea, you will do this, or we will fight. And when we fight, I don't stop until your straw house is down. Most disagreements involve name-calling and insults. They usually take disagreements very personally. Think about what Goliath does. He insults David, and he thinks David is insulting him. He says to David, am I a dog? Like, are you insulting me? And then he insults David at the same time. Typically, a conversation with a big bad wolf involves lots of, oh, yeah, well, here's what I don't like about you. Here's what I don't think you're doing right. Here's what's wrong with you. Here's the 17 facts that I wrote down. Big bad wolves are not about the topic. They're actually just about winning the fight. They are more concerned about being right about than they are about being right with. So here's what a big bad wolf will do. They don't care if you have a relationship with them that last. They care if they're right on that topic. And all that that matters is that they win that conversation that day and they'll deal with the straw that's blowing all over the yard from the house that blew down in the future. Usually, they are either extremely proud and can't handle someone else thinking they might be wrong, or they are extremely insecure and feel attacked when disagreed with, or they're just somebody who's never been told no. And so when you disagree with them and say, hey, no, actually, at our job, I don't think that we should do this because I don't think it's right, that turns into, oh, you think, I'm, you think I'm trying to suggest something wrong? I'm not trying to. You know what? I saw what you did wrong on your report. 
That turns into that conversation. Goliath said to David, do you think I'm a dog? How many times in our relationships have we said to someone, what do you think, I'm an idiot? What do you think, I'm wrong on this? Why? Big bad wolves. I remember one time when I was seven, there was a, uh, a little bit older boy, I think he was about 12, and um, he was telling a story about how his cousin, who was 16, went and got in the shower, and he spiked his hair up with hair gel, and then walked outside in minus 40 degree weather and went like this and his hair all fell off and he gave himself a buzz cut. And I was like seven and a bunch of us were sitting around and I said, I don't think that could happen. And all of a sudden this, this big bad wolf was like, you calling me a liar? Like he was in my face instantly. You calling my cousin a liar? No one calls my cousin. I'm like seven. I'm like, whoa, why? They huff and they puff and they blow your house down. So if you marry a big bad wolf, a dis disagreement about a favorite TV show can turn into a fight about personal hygiene followed by not speaking for five days. If you go to a church with a big bad wolf, a disagreement on a political issue can turn into I'm never coming back to this church ever again. If you work with a big bad wolf, you voting no on a proposal they send will then ensure that your proposals for the next three years will not be voted yes on. Because they're more interested in fighting. You want to know if you uh, know a big bad wolf? Look for someone who says, you know what? I just want to get in a good fight. Big bad wolf. So how do we deal with them? Because we all know one. We all know that person at work. We all know that person. And right now, maybe you're listening and you're like, no, I don't know any big bad wolves. I hate to tell you this, but this is you then. <laughs> because big bad wolves surround themselves with sheep. And you can't run from them. You can't outrun a big bad wolf. We try to outrun them by doing different things. A big bad wolf at work, you try to outrun them by just saying, okay, whatever you think. But that won't work. Because a big bad wolf, if you say, okay, whatever you think, they will continue to try to get a fight with you for the next five years because truly they want the fight. So by you agreeing with your spouse, just, okay, whatever you say, just, I don't want to fight, you're actually lengthening the amount of fights that you're going to have over time. Why? Because what did the, what did the pig, who, the pig built a brick house, and the big bad wolf eventually left him alone. David stood up to Goliath, and Goliath eventually left him alone. We try to hide from them, we try to outrun them. Here's how we try to outrun them. People who are married to a big bad wolf blame a lot of things on their friends or their bosses. Well, my boss said, well, my friends, they didn't, and they just try to blame anybody else. Why? Because they don't want to have the fight. They just don't want to have that fight. So if you can't outrun them and you can't hide from them, how do you deal with them? Well, I think David showed us something. You have to go for the head. And I don't mean that in a physical way. Please do not hear that in a physical way. I am not advising you to just punch someone today, okay? David goes for the head, and, and here's what I'm saying out of this. You can't argue and scream wisdom into a fool. So you have to logically show them the truth. If someone is all heart and all emotion and always shouting, you can't out-shout a wolf. So it does no good to get equally as mad and just try to physically dominate the person who's trying to physically dominate you by just being louder and more red in the face than you are. What you have to do is say, you know what, we're going to talk about that and I'm going to figure out and I'm going to bring up my seven points on why and have a logical conversation with them because typically they want to be right. And so if you logic with them, they eventually will arrive at the logical choice. I had to do this one time. Someone sent me a very angry letter in the mail telling me, here's everything you're doing wrong, and this one pastor is doing right. So I didn't answer for a month, and then I found quotes from that pastor who was doing everything right that just basically summed up everything I was doing wrong that he agreed with and replied with the quotes. Why? I'm not going to argue with them. I'm just going to try to show logically, here's what this person said, and here's what I'm doing, right? Next, you have to go 
in private. They will not feel as threatened if you don't disagree with them in public. David picked the place with Goliath. He approached him. He didn't wait for him to come to him. He approached him. And sometimes you got to pick where you're going to have this discussion. Can I tell you that the, the lobby at church at the Connect Center is not where to have the discussion about masks with the big bad wolf? They're going to feel threatened, and you can't have that conversation there. So you've got to decide, hey, in private, in a couple weeks, when everything's calm, we're going to have this discussion. Number three, you've got you've to go in prayer. Go to God before you go to them or about them. Before you go about them to somebody else, go to God and say, God, please give me wisdom on this. Before you decide, hey, we're going to have this discussion, have a discussion with the creator of the universe. He has so much more wisdom to offer than we ask him for. So we've got to pick where, and then we've got to pick who. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says this, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Philippians 2 verse 3 says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. James three seventeen and 18, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Some people are never going to listen to you, but they will listen to somebody else. So sometimes you just need to decide, I'm not going to be able to show them the error of their ways but I know they'll listen to so-and-so. Convince them that it was their idea and that they presented it and it always gets approved, right? I, I, did this, I used to do this. I used to figure out, because there was someone who would say, whatever I brought up, no. So at our job, I figured out whichever pastor out of all of us was, it was in good that month, everything that I thought up became their idea. And I would go to them and say, hey, what do you think about this? Don't you think we should do this? And at the meeting, they would bring it up and all of a sudden it got approved. Why? Because I don't have to be the one who's right. I just want to do what's right. Is it more important that a person knows what is right or that they know it was you who told them what was right? If someone's wrong, is it really more important that they know, well, yeah, well, it was Jason who told them that they need to change, or is it just important that they learn what actually is right? Then we need to pick why. We need to pick why. We cannot get distracted. There will be battles every time you disagree with them. But David knew exactly why he was fighting Goliath. If you remember 1 Samuel 17, he keeps bringing up, you have defied God. You have defied God. You have defied God. You have defied God. What is David doing? Reminding himself why he's fighting Goliath. You cannot lead anyone, please hear this if you hear nothing else, you cannot lead anyone if you are too busy fighting with everyone. You cannot lead anyone if you're too busy fighting with everyone. So if you've got a list of 17 people that you're in a fight with, you can't lead anyone because you're so distracted running around fighting different battles that no one is going to actually follow you to the truth. Don't get so busy fighting every battle. Stay focused. Know why you fight. Why do you fight? I've decided that I will fight for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will have arguments about the gospel of Jesus Christ and almost nothing else. Go ahead and remind me that Michigan got beat by Michigan State, and it will not be a fight because I'm not going to fight you about that, Brandon. I've made up my mind. I'm not going to fight you about your team always beating my team (laughs) because you know what? In about three weeks, the other team is going to beat my team, and it's been happening. So I've decided I won't fight about that. What I want to fight about, I'll fight about the gospel. 
I really want to fight about it right now. <laughs> I want to fight about the gospel. I want to be known for, you know what, he fights for Jesus and the wonder-working God that Jesus is. I will fight for my church family, insult my church family to me, and we will have a discussion. And I will fight for my family. And I'm not going to fight with people about anything else. You can have every argument you want about which new movie and new show and new this and new that. I'm going to fight for those things, and I'm going to stay focused, and I'm going to say, if you defy God, we're going to have a conversation. If you, if you deny the gospel that Jesus Christ came to this earth, he loves you, and he died for you, and he wants to save you, and he is God, we'll have that discussion, but I'm not going to fight about Jim Harbaugh any longer because it's a waste of time. And if you're too busy fighting everybody, you can't lead anybody. Listen to this verse, because this verse is going to say it a lot harsher than I do. 2 Timothy 2, 16 and 17. Shun profane and vain babblings. They will only increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat like a canker. Here's what that means. If you're fighting everybody all the time about all kinds of things, eventually you get like a canker sore where it's just festering and festering and it's eating you alive. And you wake up at 4 a.m. to send that text because I just remembered one other thing. The word canker means a disease that corrupts a part of the body and unless treated will continually spread and attack the entire body, eating it away. It will rot and eat it away. And continually arguing with a wolf will only get you eaten. 2 Timothy 2.23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they gender strife. Titus 3.9, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving. I mean, the Bible can't say it any more clear. We don't need to spend every second of our day fighting about everything with everybody because you can't lead anybody. So number five, pick your point of view. They may be right about one thing. They may be right. And they might have said it wrong, and they might have yelled at you, and they might have told you in the rudest, most unkind way ever, but they might be telling you the truth. Look at what Proverbs 12, verse 1 says. This verse is amazing to me. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. I mean, that's not me. That's God. That's the creator of the universe saying that, not me. So if God brought a big, bad wolf into your life to teach you one thing you're wrong on, then learn it. You can always choose to learn what you can learn and then just choose to forget the rest. You said 18 things that were mean, but you did tell me the truth in this one, so I'm going to learn that. Proverbs 13, 18. Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is honored. God says it is an honor to learn. It's an honor to say, yeah, I was wrong about that. And yeah, you are so mean, but I was wrong. Yeah, you yelled at me in the company-wide Zoom, and then you yelled at me at the company picnic, and then you yelled at me at the company party, and then I wore this thing, and you told me everything wrong I wore to the Halloween company party, but you were right about this one thing, and so I wanted to tell you, hey, you were right, and I'm going to try to learn not to do that anymore. It's an honor for Christians when we do that. At the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, do you love being right, or do you love learning what is right? You have to ask yourself, which one do you love more? Do you just love being right, like I am right and no one can tell me wrong, or do you love to find out, oh, this is the truth and I just uncovered it? And it was in a painful way, but I found it. There's the truth. It is an honor to recognize that you are wrong and that you can change your opinion. Then number six, you have to pick your scriptures. 
Psalm 119, verse 165. A great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. James 3.17, we read this earlier, but the wisdom that is from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make pre peace. If they are a believer, and you are a believer, let the scriptures do your fighting for you. Because if they're a believer, they believe the Bible. So rather than spend 30 minutes yelling till you're blue in the face, allow the Bible to show them the truth. God can speak the truth so much better than I ever could. So rather than, hey, I'm right, you're wrong, name calling, insults, fights, arguments, cold shoulders for five days, here's two Bible verses. I think you should check them out. And here's two Bible verses that I'm checking out because I'm trying to make sure that I learn what's right as well. Do you need to see things your way or do you need to see things the right way? That's the ultimate question. Is it about me being right or is it about we just want to learn what is right? Lastly, remember whose opinion truly matters. Psalm 16, 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. At the end of the day, it is God's opinion that matters. And sometimes shouting at a big bad wolf and threatening to blow their straw house down because they're blowing your straw house down will get you nowhere. And pointing out to grandma's big ugly teeth will only get you eaten. Little Red Riding Hood should have ran for her life, but she spent her time pointing out everything wrong with the grandma. I'm sorry. If I go to my grandma's and she has pointy ears and big eyes and huge fangs, I'm out the door. I'm gone. We need to lean into God's opinion is what matters. So, a lot of questions. Are you a wolf? Are you a big bad wolf? If so, maybe it's time to recognize, man, I really need to humble myself and allow God and others to disagree with me without me throwing a fit. Do you know a wolf? Figure out a way to have conversations that are peaceable and gentle and easy and full of wisdom and knowledge and go for the conversation that is logical rather than I'm going to just yell until you actually hear me. If you think about this, Jesus was the good shepherd. In a world of wolves, Jesus laid down his life for the sheep. Could have spent his time constantly reminding us what's wrong with us every day of the year. He would have been right to do that because he's God. He could follow us around saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And instead, what did he do? He laid down his life for the sheep. He loved us so much. And how did he show us what is true in today's world? He left us the scriptures. Because if we believe that God created us and that this is his book, he knows that we will then learn what is right by absorbing and reading and studying his book. Rather than by just blaring out everything we do wrong all the time. The truth is in the scriptures. And I think that we remember his death on days like this. So we're about to take communion. I'm going to have the uh, worship team come up here in just a minute. But before they do, let me just, as we get ready to close the service out, let me just remind you that what we celebrate about God is that he had conversations that led to growth and wisdom in people like Peter, who was always trying to fight everybody. But we find Peter at the end of his life writing books that are full of wisdom and righteousness and full of truth in a great and good way. You could argue that he turned Peter from being a big bad wolf into being one of the leaders of the church. And he loved him and he died for him to show him the ultimate way. What is the way? For us, 
It is to recognize that Jesus Christ came to this earth as God. He lived and he died for us. And he did so to change us and to give us a home with him forever. Then he left us his scriptures in the Holy Spirit to guide us and to show us how to live peaceably in a world where there is no peace. So we're about to do something here. We're going to celebrate and remember what he did. We are going to remember that he died for us. Mm -hmm.